So this is the talk, um, Nerd Wrangling 101. I have with me on stage two wonderful people who manage tech and product, as they told me, and they're going to talk about um, neurodiversity as an approach to disability and learning. And um, as I have no idea w what this is all about, I will leave the stage to you. Please give a warm applause to our wonderful speakers. Hi. Um, we're going to talk uh, about neurodiversity and cognitive empathy. And if those two words don't ring a bell for you, don't worry. We're going to get that covered. They will by the end of the talk. Um, who are we? Um, we're Meredith. Hi. And I'm Julian. Uh, um, we work at Mountain Noah Technologies, which is a small fintech startup. And yeah, and Meredith managed the technical side of things, I manage the product side of things, and together we uh, also manage a bunch of highly neurodiverse people uh, who happen to be great people uh, and we, we, love, to we also, love to work with. We happen to also be you know, pretty neurodiverse ourselves, as it turns out. So neurodiversity, um, what is neurodiversity? Neurodiversity is very well depicted in Winnie the Pooh, um, and the idea behind it is that Traits such as ADHD, ADD, things on the autism spectrum, but also disorders such as uh, depression and anxiety are all just part of uh, the normal human biome. They're nothing outlandish, they're just le less common, but they're still um, part of uh, everyday... Uh, but the overall spectrum of human expression, basically. Thank you very much. They're just a show of diversity. Um, that's so far, but what does that actually mean? Um, quick show of hands, who of you have been di diagnosed with one of the symptoms I just mentioned? ADD, ADHD, autism, uh, depression, anxiety? Um, that's not a lot of hands. So who of you wouldn't admit that they had been diagnosed even if they were? See? And that's the problem. Um, we're going to talk about why, um, why we want to do this talk. Um, that's, that's actually your slide. Oh, um, right. So, yeah, the reason why we're giving this talk, uh, you know, we'll be going over, you know, shortly. Then we'll talk about, you know, we'll go into a little more detail on what neurodiversity is. Specifically, you know, we're, we're, this is mostly from our own experience, so we're going to be talking largely about what we individually deal with and what we deal with with regard to our teammates. Um, and then we're going to talk about who's affected. So, yeah, um, why are we doing this talk? Um, first of all, it matters to us. I'm diagnosed with ADHD. I'm autistic. And both of us have been in, you know, work situations where um, processes and procedures that were tailored to people with a, a more modal, you know, more neurotypical way of, of functioning, um, you know, really did a lot of damage to us. You know, you know, we were not able to function in environments that expected behaviors that we weren't able to deliver and weren't willing to, you know, help us cope with with, the, with the differences of our own brains. Yeah. It, is all, it should also matter to you, because while not all of you have been diagnosed with uh, uh, some sort of neurodiverse um, uh, quirk, um, your peers probably have, at least if you're hackers, if you consider yourself nerds, if you are around a hackerspace, if you work in a in an environment where there are highly skilled people, you will probably encounter people who either have, auti uh, have ADHD or they're diagnosed with, uh, with autism or they uh, are suffering from depression. And that should actually matter to you because you want to take them seriously. And there is stuff to be done about it, and that's what we're going to talk at, at the end, is how we approach um, dealing with a very diverse uh, crowd. Yeah, I mean, these variations are not necessarily fixed points. And the processes that we organize for ourselves are certainly not, not fixed points. And there are ways to define processes that are much more accepting and welcoming to people with less typical 
traits? So um, let's explain uh, neurodiversity a little. Um, that's the interest. Uh, just, just so yeah. Uh, as far as, uh, as I said earlier, you know, there's there's an extremely wide range of human phenotypic expression. I mean, and this this stems both from the you know the genes that people are born with and the environments that they're that they are raised in. Um, you know, many of the uh, many of the, the components of what people regard as disorders are actually coping strategies for environments that, you know, that, people, that people were raised in. They learned these coping strategies early. They haven't learned to let go of them yet. Um, but that said, you know, there can be plus sides as well. I mean, you know, as, as far as ADHD and Asperger's go, uh, let's move on because Julian's going to talk about the ADHD part. So, um yeah, ADHD. I'm going to sort of do a sort of intro about ADHD. First of all, I can't remember everything, so this is going to be a little unstructured. And second, um, I, the, it's impossible to, to do more than just scratching the surface on that kind of topic. We could fill whole evenings with talking about um, classifying and, and, and explaining uh, such, such, a, uh, such a disorder as ADD or ADHD. Um, someone, I think, on Reddit once explained ADHD as like trying to concentrate while 10 squirrels are jumping up your legs, um, which is partially accurate. Um, ADHD, and that's a very, very, very short e uh, explanation, comes from a certain type of filter weakness where you are not able to filter out uh, impulses from, from the outside or external stimuli, and therefore consider it equally important talking on stage while watching the people pass in, uh, in the back of the tent. And therefore, it's quite difficult to actually concentrate on what you're doing right now. But it's also, there's also very, it manifests itself in very, very different types, and I'm going to go into that in a second. Um, and part of ADHD is um, coming with, uh, even, the, uh, even though only part of it is actually neurological and therefore cannot be changed, only medicated to a certain point, it comes with a lot of acquired psychological behavior that is basically learned as a coping, te coping technique for managing to uh, run around in the real world. Um, there's a wonderful post on Tumblr we found recently that explains one part of ADHD, and it's really not everything, but uh, just to, as I said, to scratch the surface. There's also things like the emotional, uh, emotional roller coaster pro problem that, um, uh, that comes with it and other things. Um, there's basically two ADHD moods, and that's I can't do it, and I can't stop doing it. Or put it differently, there's two types of ADHD time, now and not now. Or even differently, there's two types of ADHD memory modes. I literally cannot recall the words that just came out of my mouth, and I can recite the opening paragraph of every single Magic Treehouse book. Um, there's a reason for that, and the reason for that is called the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is this part of the brain. Um, and the basal ganglia is, and its dopamine-producing cells are responsible for things that, like voluntary movement. And in people with ADHD, it gets stuck in the either on or the off position. There's no, absolutely no middle ground, so it's either go or no go, and, it's, and that's it. And, that's, and getting it unstuck is damn near impossible. And in addition to many other things, the basal ganglia and its dopamine-producing cells also happen to be involved in both the formation and the recall of memory. Basically, dopamine is how our ancestors survived in the, in the before times, learning new things, discovering new food sources, developing new technologies, teaching all, the, all those things that are not only make people and communities survive, but also thrive and are in large part related to dopamine in the pathways that original, originate from the basal ganglia. ADHD is a basal ganglia neurodivergence. Ours are literally different than theirs, and it basically involves our thresholds for make more dopamine or, okay, that's not, that's not enough, eh, that's enough, stop making dopamine right now, thanks. Being different, so we always either don't have enough to make anything happen at all, being stuff in the off uh, position, or we have so much that we will keep going on forever and ever and ever, being stuck in the on position. Whereas neurotypical basal ganglia are more even 
more even with more steady amounts of production, thus they don't get stuck in the other position and they don't have these extremes. This basically means either I don't do work at all or I get stuck in it and get in a, in a hyper-focus mode where I can go on forever and even forget food sometimes. Um, and that actually makes it sort of one of the, we called it earlier, superpowers. It's basically like your favorite Marvel superheroes, right? Um, they have superpowers, but they're also weakened by them. Um, the Hulk, uh, who's probably more an autistic type, um, uh, has his meltdowns and smashes things, but he's also incredibly strong. And incredibly uh, smart. He's Bruce Banner as well. So um, just that one example where weaknesses and strengths come together, they're just more on the extreme side. Um, there's, as I said, there's different type of ADHD. Um, there's the hyperactive type, um, um, which is, yeah, Tigger. Tigger is inattentive, impulsive, hyperactive, restless, and bouncy. Tigger just wants to bounce. But there's also um, Winnie the Pooh, for example, who's actually not 100% ADHD, but still is. He's inattentive, he's distractible, he's disorganized, he's nice, but he lives in a cloud. But that he's said, you know, he, he exhibits more of an inattentive type of ADHD. He's also very routine-bound. He tends to get distressed when his routine gets disrupted, and he also looks for comfort in certain stimuli, particularly taste. Pooh is possibly a, a hypo-taster, and, you know, looks for comfort in tasting honey. Yeah. Um, so let's continue to the next slide, which is also yours, uh, so Autism Spectrum Disorder. Somebody said this on Reddit, and it's, it rings very, very true to me. I mean, being autistic is very much like being part of a movie where everybody else has the script. And in fact, oftentimes I find myself, you know, when I need to you know, when I need to prepare for something, you know, you know, something new or, you know, like, you know, calling up a new doctor's office or something like that, I, I will literally prepare myself a script to work through. Um, one thing that a lot of people really don't understand about autism that I, think is the, that I think is super important and I wish more people understood is that at the baseline, it's very much a disorder of, uh, you know, difference in senses. It's like the gain is way turned, uh, turned way up or way down on, you know, vision or hearing or taste, or even internal senses like interoception, your feeling of what's going on inside your body, or even, or, or even, your, or even your emotions. I mean, I know people, I know autistic people who are just super hyper aware of not just their own emotions, but the emotions of others. Um, in my case, I kind of have crazy bat hearing. Um, I can typically resolve conversations through walls um, and hear about three or four conversations going on around me at a time and keep track of them all. Um, and this actually gets kind of overwhelming after a while. And so if, you, you know, if I suddenly disappear at a con, it's probably because I've just gotten way too much audio input for the last couple of hours and need to go off and hide for a while. Um, pattern matching is also a huge strength among autistic kids. And, and adults, um, but you know, can also be a weakness. Um, studies on children have shown that autistic children recognize patterns faster than neurotypical kids do. Uh, you know, they give them a pattern matching exercise and the autistic kids pick it up quicker, but they're slower to recognize when the pattern has changed. Um, and you know, when that pattern changes, it can be kind of distressing. You know, we're very detail-oriented, um, and that often tends to derive from, uh, from increased sensory acuity. I know a lot of, like more than one at least, autistic network admins who have set up audio pipelines that let them listen to the state of their network because that's, that's the sense that they, that they process information most efficiently on. And now we don't really know why autistic people tend to be systematizers. There's still a lot of brain imaging going on, you know, trying to figure out what exactly is going on here. You know, we know that there are differences like, um, you know, neurons tend to be locally overconnected, but underconnected over long distances compared to neurotypical people. We also know that there tends to be synaptic overgrowth. Autistic people don't prune away. Um, uh, don't prune away sy new synapses as fast as neurotypical people do, but you know we're still working on figuring out the implications of this. And so our Winnie the Pooh character for this uh, that, that we chose is Rue. Um, 
you know, he, he's seemingly unaware of risk. You know, he's always rushing off into the, 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 new inter the, the next interesting thing. He's utterly fascinated by small details. Um, but he's also got some sensory-seeking behavior. When he's, uh, you know, when he's feeling shy or stressed out, he climbs into his mother's pouch to get tactile stimulation for comfort. So, I've talked a little bit about, um, you know, the way that the, the strengths of autism can be a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, let's, let's talk uh, about some of the more general problems that uh, tend to come up as comorbidities uh, with these, uh, with other disorders. So yes, we're talking about the disorders. Uh, what we mean is saying things like depression, anxiety, and things like that. And we call them super weaknesses because compared to, say, ADHD or autism, there's no real upside. No one wants to be depressed, and even if depression itself can give you a sort of unique insight into life, that's at least what I've never, gladly never been depressed uh, in a clinical way, but um, that's what people tell me who have. They gain a certain uh, perspective on life they wouldn't have gained otherwise. It's still no real upside on it. It's a very often, however, a coping technique for, uh, your, for neurological situations such as ADHD and autism, and therefore very, very often comorbid. When people are put into situations where they're essentially forced to you know, fit into routines that don't fit them, you know, shutting down is, uh, is a common reaction uh, to that. And that's basically you know, d what depression is. I mean, you know, our representative character for this is Eeyore, right? You know, everybody thinks of him, he's like, you know, he's sad, he never wants to go anywhere, you know, but his friends take him seriously and they, and they, they ask him along anyway. But it's important to realize that depression is way more than just sadness. It's, also, it's, it's basically the inability to feel like you ever will be happy again at some point. And, you know, Eeyore's got intrusive thoughts, you know, he's, he's you know, his, his tagline is, thanks for noticing me. You know, he feels, he feels invisible. And, you know, depression is one that, you know, that, that at least, you know, between the two of us, we're always very careful to look out for because, you know, depression kills people. You know, my husband, Len, died to suicide six years ago. And, you know, we've lost other people, you know, just in the last month or so. We don't want to lose any more. So, anxiety. Um, Piglet is nervous. Piglet worries all the time. Piglet is anxious. Um, anxiety comes um, with very many different, uh, for, for many different reasons out of, uh, uh, comes to people for many different reasons, but a certain anxiety, especially a certain social anxiety, lives within all those people who feel um, somehow not fitting into society, and that comes very much with uh, people, uh, with neurodiverse people, um, because as you can all imagine, if you don't fit in, you actually start to be, talking, uh, be afraid of talking to people at some point. It kind of becomes example. a self-fulfilling prophecy after a while. And then there's another weakness, and that is addiction. Addiction is very common because it's a very common comorbidity because substance, substance as use is often referred to as self-medication. And as Winnie the Pooh self-medicates with a lot of sugar, like honey, um, others um, medicate with, say, weed, say... Um, um, Booze. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like, I woke up this morning with the pre-talk jitters, and I screwed up, and I left my Lyrica at home. Lyrica is a GABA inhibitor. So is ethanol. Breakfast this morning was pancakes and stout. Um, also, uh, stimulants like amphetamines, because turns out uh, Ritalin that is prescribed medically for people with ADHD is not that different from, from, uh, from speed. So um, people who try this feel really, really much better during trying this, uh, will probably tend to uh, try it again or use it again and therefore get into some sort of habit of using it, and then that slowly slides into an addiction. So, yes, addiction to substances is very common, and it is a problem. And some, sometimes uh, the condition itself, the disorder itself, keeps 
self-medicated people from seeking help for their addiction or even for their situation. Because if you're, uh, if you're way out depressed and uh, whatever you do to handle your depression uh, is turning into addiction, you're still too depressed to go to a doctor, just as an example. Yeah, like getting up the executive function to make that phone call can be really hard. Then there's another thing that's not that much a clinical uh, term, but it's still worth noticing because most of you uh, will likely suffer from it, and that's the imposter syndrome. And I found this slide yesterday on, on Twitter, I think, and I uh, found it really nice, so we put it up there. Yeah, I mean, I think this one tends to be a driver of a lot of pathology because people have a bad tendency to compare themselves unfairly. They think, oh gosh, you know, what I know is just this small amount, and everybody else knows so much more stuff. But what, what they're not taking into account is that when they're comparing themselves to everybody else as a unit, like you're, you're comparing one person to all the people and you know, none of us is as smart as all of us. It's much more fair to look at what other people know as the overlap of everybody's knowledge, which of course you're not going to be able to subsume all of. Yeah. Social aspects, also a very, very important point. And that also comes into um, what people are dealing with, for example, in their workplace. Neurodiversity is not visible. And that means that behaving differently will just turn people, uh, the, the, others, the others, to uh, turn away from you, to um, shun you out, because um, they don't see that you are somehow different. They just experience you as annoying, as weird, as awkward. I mean, even if you have an assistive device, it's usually an assistive, de an assistive device that is available to you because it's available on the open market, like sunglasses or noise-canceling headphones, which makes you that weirdo that wears sunglasses inside because the fluorescent lights fuck with you. Exactly. Um, discrimination uh, happens a lot, therefore, and discrimination is not only people in the schoolyard uh, pointing fingers at you and shouting, ha ha. Discrimination is also systemic. Um, the way schools are built, the way university is built, um, expects a certain neurotypical behavior, like listening, like being attentive, like not fidgeting around, like being able to actually study for an exam and take this exam and being uh, able to function under pressure. People who don't, uh, people who can't cope with that um, fall through the system. Um, hence a quote from uh, Alan Raskin, The Wrestling Game, which is a children's mystery novel. Um, that I read when I was a kid, seriously. Um, yeah, but the quote is beautiful because um, the quote is, the poor are crazy, the rich just eccentric. Um, Meaning that while Meredith and I grew up in a sort of middle-class background, uh, being, having helpful parents and have, living in, uh, in an environment that sort of, even though we were weird and we didn't really manage school as well as we could have with our IQs, um, we still managed to get through all this. I, didn't, I wasn't even diagnosed until my 20s, but I did have parents who stood up for me throughout my childhood. Yes. Imagine you ha don't have these kind of parents, you don't have this kind of environment people just fall through the system. And I know quite a few people who have never managed to get a high school diploma, who have never managed to get a proper job, who have maybe taken years and years and years of their life until they finally got a diagnosis or they're undiagnosed, um, and they finally gotten help, um, gotten into jail. Uh, like, incarceration rate for people with ADHD is way higher than with, for neurotypical people because they just fall through the system. And that is a huge problem, and that is also worth, therefore worth mentioning. So, uh, who is affected? Us. Um, it's your slide, so oh. continue. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so... Um as I said earlier, we're a small startup. Uh, we're about 10 people, um, and pretty much everybody that we work with, uh, ourselves included, are, you know, are somehow affected by neurodiversity. Um, some of us are on the spectrum. There's a bunch of us on the spectrum, in fact. Uh, some of us are ADHD. Um, several people have depression. Several people have OCD. Um, you know, several people have some anxiety issues. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on. But, you know, 
we want to be able to work with people well, and so, you know, we had to figure out a way to deal with it. You know, we don't want to burn through people. We know that these are, that these are you know, smart, talented people, and if we can give them the environment they need to excel, they'll do it. Um, who's also affected? You well, folks. You are, you, you know, y'all are affected as well. Um, you know, plenty of people in this audience uh, are going to match, you know, the, the descriptions that, uh, that we were describing earlier. But even if you yourself are, you know, the, the more modal, you know, neurotypical person, a lot of the people around you are not. And, you know, being able to interact with them successfully requires being able to, you know, understand where they are and where they're coming from. And I gotta say, you know, the hacker community is a place where I've experienced more of that from neurotypical people than pretty much any place else I've ever been, which is why I stick around here. Um, I'm not sure how we expand this out to the broader world, but we gotta start talking about it here. I mean, you wanna take people seriously, that means understanding where they come from. So let's talk about empathy. Um, empathy comes in two ways. There's cognitive and there's effective empathy. And what that is, we will explain in the next slides. There's um, a couple of requirements to manage with cognitive empathy because it's actually not that easy. But we will talk about that and then we will talk about the solution orientation that comes with it. Um, and then I will, with that, I will hand over to Meredith who will explain effective empathy to you. Right. So. Most of the time when people think about empathy, what they're, actually think of is a what they're actually thinking of is affective empathy. Because you ask the average person, hey, what does empathy mean? They mean, oh, being affected by what other people around you are feeling. And that's where it comes from, the word affect. Uh, and so there are basically two ways that you can, you can be affected by the emotions of other people. One of them is other-oriented and the other one is self-oriented. So if you're expressing empathic concern, if you're expressing sympathy and compassion for the suffering of other people around you, that's an other-oriented uh, way of expressing affective empathy. And I'm gonna cut to the bottom of the slide. I mean, affective empathy is absolutely essential for establishing rapport with people, especially people who you don't know well, but even people who you do. Um, the flip side, however, of, uh, of empathic concern is the, the self-oriented response of being personally distressed by other people's discomfort. And this is really not helpful because you're basically shifting the focus from the other person's suffering onto, well, now I'm suffering because of your suffering. And, you know, that makes them feel bad and it's just this horrible feedback loop of awful. Um, and this can, be hard to, this can be hard to distance yourself from, right? Because somatic empathy is another facet of affective empathy that is literally baked into your, the neurons in your brain. You have a set of neurons known as mirror neurons, and when you perceive that someone else is in distress, or in any other mood for that matter, if you perceive their happiness, you know, whatever, whatever they're perceiving, these mirror neurons will basically reflect that feeling onto your own emotional state. I mean, this is basically part of how we human at all. Um, and, you know, if, if, if you have very strong somatic empathy, it can be very difficult to kind of tease that out from the, from the, self from the self oriented personal distress aspect of affective empathy. But empathic concern is still really, really important, you know, when you're trying to be good to people. And this, it, 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 basically, it's a shitty tool for understanding other people, but it's a really good tool for getting them to respond to you. And by the way, we know that this slide is asymmetrical, um, and we're sorry to people whose aesthetic sensibility this offends. Um, let's talk about cognitive empathy. Right. So cognitive empathy, on the other hand, is, you know, it, so if, if, af if affective empathy is about near mode, the right here and now, the present, you know, what, what you're feeling, cognitive empathy is more thinking oriented. It's about understanding the state of mind that another person is in, you know, and the perspective that they have. How are they seeing things? So the first step is to be able to take other people's perspectives, to be able to understand, you know, where their motivations are coming from and what those motivations are driving them to do. And once you can, once you can do that, once you can, once you can 
both recognize and accept empathy and model to the other people around you how it works, you can start using it tactically. You can, you can use perspective taking deliberately. And this is super important, right? Because if you try to use it naively, if you try to like, you know, prod people into like, you know, uh, in, into, into giving you all the information that, you know, that you need to make inferences before they're ready, you can, you can make people shut down that way, right? So you, you have to, you have to be, be careful with, you know, with how you try to get people to open up to you. But basically, um, you know, you hear sometimes, uh, especially if you pay attention to the autism literature, about theory of mind. You know, Simon Baron Cohen uh, talks about theory of mind as the ability to model, you know, what another person is thinking, you know, what their state of mind is. I disagree with Baron Cohen uh, when he says that uh, autistic people have no theory of mind. Um, I think that we actually have a theory of multiple minds, whereas neurotypicals have the luxury of being able to get away with, th with a theory of just one mind. Um, one that is very much like their own. Um, and so, in order to be able to practice cognitive empathy, like I said earlier, you have to be willing to step out of this perspective that may very well have been comfortable to you all your life in order to be able to take the perspectives of other people and understand them. So, what do we need to practice cognitive empathy, especially in a team company environment? But it could also be your hackerspace or your open source project. First, you need courage. The courage to be able to openly talk about what's going on inside of you, being able to talk about um, your, your diagnosis, your neurological conditions, your basic quirks. But also, you need time, the time to actually listen, to talk about these things, to not just assume that, you're, uh, that the person opposite to you is Norm neurotypical and doesn't have any uh, special uh, kinds of requirements to work to, together with others, but rather to assume the opposite. And that's, uh, it's, that is going to take a lot of time for listening and for dealing with each other. It also needs a certain understanding of, uh, ba of, of the basic conditions, which means it's helpful if you don't know anything about ADHD to have read a book. It's helpful uh, to read something up about autism, it's helpful maybe to have such a condition yourself, but it's not ob obviously not necessary. It's just helpful to know what the, what's going on. And you need psychological visibility. And that means re regularly checking in on each other and regularly talking openly about uh, their, the current state of mind. People need to be recognized as people. That's a very deep-seated human need. So going on to being solution-oriented. Solution orientation in uh, working together as neurodiverse team, in managing a neurodiverse team, is admitting, listening, and acting, being leading by example, which is also on the next slide, but I'm just uh, grabbing that uh, sentence anyway. So um, admitting that you're vulnerable, leading by example as management, for example, to say, yes, I am... I have the same problems as you. Um, being able to listen fully and understanding fully that whatever your colleagues, coworkers, peers are uh, telling you is actually serious and is not just some ha ha funny thing, or they can just brush it off and uh, and act normal again. And acting upon it means that if you have a, if you then understand what's going on with your uh, with your peer. Um, finding a way to support this person in any way possible. And that can be many ways, and we're going to show some examples later, but acting upon this is uh, very much uh, the, the, the next step, and it's not just listening, and it's not just comforting, it's actually doing something. Yeah, it's, help, it's helping people take steps to, to, to help true. themselves. But, you know, but before that, it's also important to take the advice that you hear on every airplane and put on your own oxygen mask, your own oxygen mask first before diving into the crisis. Okay, so there are four there are, there are four things that we're going to talk. I can't, what? Oh, uh, no, you are fine. I was okay. Fine. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, so there are four strategies that we want to talk about as far as uh, building a robust team that is highly accepting of neurodiversity. 
uh, leading by example, which Julian has already mentioned. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, maintaining a deep bench. We're going to talk about how we deal with praise and criticism. And then we're going to go into some practical examples of, you know, from things we've actually dealt with at work. Leading by example. It starts by saying, yes, we are also affected. If you are, if you're not, it's at least a yes, I completely understand that you are neurodiverse in some way. And sometimes it means like taking some initiative, right? There are days that I've said, look, folks, I'm having a bad brain day. I'm not, gonna get, I'm not expecting to get anything done task-wise today, but if anybody needs me, feel free to hit me up. Next one is to make sure that it's okay to be vulnerable. Creating a culture of vulnerability and creating a culture of um, accepting that nobody is super strong, but people are actually weak from time to time. Um, as our boss puts it, um, we're all a bunch of Alfa Romeos. They're super fast and super slick when they run, but they also need a really long time in the garage every once in a while. And that's basically the, the motto for our culture. We want Alfa Romeos, not Alfa Males. Um, and the last part is listening. Um, listening to everybody and all the time and being understanding. And I've gotten into that before, so I'll just uh, keep it at that. Maintaining a deep bench. Yeah, so maintaining a deep bench means making sure that people's technical expertise is widespread throughout the organization and that you have lots of people who are familiar with, you know, with the different components of your system. You don't want to have any bottlenecks you know, in particular because being the bottleneck for something that people depend on is stressful in and of itself, and you want to not put that stress on people's shoulders in the first place. Um, you know, you want to keep the bus number on every component of whatever you're building high so that if somebody's, you know, so that if somebody gets sick or their brain is screwing with them that day, somebody else can pick up, move on a little with it, set it back down when they're ready to come back to it. Downtimes are a normal thing, though. Like, this is a thing you have to plan for. Like, you have to accept that the duty cycle of the humans under you is not going to be 100% ever. Praise and criticism. Right. So, one of the most important lessons that I learned in the Army, believe it or not, is that it is crucial to praise people in public, but criticize them in private. Since then, however, I've also learned that it is important to make this public knowledge that that, that is standard practice, because you don't want to end up in the situation where, you know, everybody's getting praise, including, you know, people who are also getting criticism behind the scenes, but everybody only ever sees themselves getting criticism, and so everybody feels like they're the only one ever getting, you know, ever getting pushback. You know, that, that make sure that people, you know, make sure that people know that this is the way you're going to do it, so that they don't always feel like they're being singled out even in private. It's also important to find understanding ways to criticize people, like sarcasm and criticism do not mix, not if you're trying to create a healthy team. And it's also important to praise people not just for, you know, huge milestones, but, you know, even small accomplishments, right? I mean, you know, it's an important engineering skill to be able to break down a big task into smaller tasks, and so, you know, when people say, you know, hey, I got this step done on my larger task, you know, I cheer them on because that helps them to realize that, you know, they're their work and, you know, and the part of themselves that they put into it is being seen. And I can give an, a, a concrete example on that because I recently talked to one coworker who called me up because of depression issues and we figured out that one problem was that his tux, tasks were feeling too large, even though they were like, you know, standard software development, one to two to maybe three day tasks, he was overwhelmed by them, so we actually sat down and tried to somehow break them down even further, even further, so that he could have quick uh, response and quick uh, recognition for what he was doing, and that actually helped him to get better. Practical examples. Um, and I already gave you one. The other one is that we, uh, as we have team members who have regular anxiety problems, we established as a, what we call an anxiety check-in. Um, basically, when people feel anxious and people, for example, um, have problems with asking for help, even in a work-related context, 
um, people are maybe suffering from social anxiety, it helps very much to check in once in a while and saying, listen, uh, how are you? Can I help you? Is there something I can support you with instead of just waiting for them to ask for help? Um, and sometimes this has to be an iterated process, right? I mean, sometimes it takes a while for people to open up to you and you have to be willing to accept the answer of no. Like if somebody's not willing to talk about something, you have to let them, you know, if, accepting them means, means being okay with that. Give them time and then, and then maybe they will. The next one is providing both freedom and structure, and that's especially important in ADHD context. As an ADHD person, I would love to have no structure at all. Structure is really, really harmful. Uh, not harmful, but uh, annoying to me. And at the same time, without structure, I can't do anything. I need to somehow organize myself. And while I'm working, uh, and our team is uh, geographically uh, uh, spread out over two continents and five countries. Um, we, we work mostly from home, so that is not exactly beneficial to giving people structure, so we have to uh, find different ways. On the other hand, it's very helpful if you are absolutely incapable, and that's, uh, that includes me, of getting up early and maintain, maintaining some sort of um, daily uh, um, eight-hour showing FaceTime sort of situation. Um, in truth, you're way less productive than eight hours a day. You mostly work in bursts, at least I do. And um, you're much better at sort of, if, if you get yourself organized, it's much better to actually accept that you're not going to be so, sort of uh, on full, uh, full speed all the time, but rather, you know, if you decide to now, that now is time for a nap or for a rest, then you actually do that. So that's the kind of freedom we actually like and that works for us. At the same time, we need some sort of structure. Um, for example, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that example uh, uh, later, yeah. Um, the next one is for you. Right, so one thing that, uh, that we've also noticed, particularly with this distributed team, is people can, you know, people can start to feel a little isolated after a while. Um, and one thing that's helped uh, not just, you know, some of my teammates, but, but also me, is, um, you know, when I'm feeling isolated, I reach out and find somebody to pair with. Um, and this helps me as a manager because it gets me more hands-on with the code that other people are writing. Um, so, again, increasing bus numbers. Um, but one thing that's important uh, to keep in mind about that is that, you know, not everybody is necessarily going to have the capacity to be able to pair either remotely or in person. Like, some people just cannot maintain, like, a text channel and an audio channel at the same time, for instance, and trying to force them to do that is, is just cruel and mean. Um, you know, so again, listen to people when they tell you what their capabilities are. By the way, pairing is not only pair programming, which is you know, the most logical example, but um, you can pair on anything. You can pair... Oh, yeah, on, I, I pair DevOps. Yeah, you can pair... Yeah, or pair, yeah, that's still technical, but you can also pair on a PowerPoint slide if you want. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. You could totally pair cook, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, we've done that at the... Uh, at the when we've done retreats. Yeah. <laughs> um, everything else is basically stories, and we're going to just share a couple of stories from our everyday work uh, life. Um, one is the one I, w I was talking about earlier, and that's the structure versus freedom things. Um, one coworker of mine is uh, definitely very has, has is definitely has ADHD, and he's got stronger days and weaker days. And recently, on a more weaker day, I called him up because we agreed upon calling. That's another thing we practice. We don't just call up people. We talk about it before. Do you want to rather chat or not? Because it might, you know. Um, impair their, uh, their, their functionality afterwards, their executive function, when they are exhausted from a phone call. But we called because he, liked to f he likes to do phone calls. And I told him, okay, um, I need the following, and I need it in this manner. I want you to do A, I explicitly don't want you to do B, and I need it soon. Two days later, he sent me B and said, I thought you want me to explicitly not do A. What did I learn from that? Well, first of all, I gave him pro next time I gave him a proper deadline and not just said soon, but you know that was a, an hour task, so he could have done it uh, in the next you know couple of hours at least. He was distracted doing other things, very productive, but not what I needed right now. And the other thing was, 
that uh, I now, after every call, after everything we do, I write, uh, write down a protocol of exactly what we talked about and give him exact instructions, instructions because obviously not everybody is capable of listening properly and, uh, at, all the ti uh, at all times, and that will cre create problems at some point. Um, so another example, um, you know, Julian was saying that you know this developer had you know good days and bad days. You know sometimes good days and bad days can be provoked by outside causes. Um, we have one developer who lives in an area that is very very prone to civil disturbances, and he is extremely triggered by violence. Like he basically has PTSD over this. Um, every time you know every, every time there's a civil disturbance in his area, like you know we know he's going to freak out. But you know, part of what contributed to the intensity of this is that at previous jobs he'd held, um, he'd basically been you know, belittled and shamed for having that reaction. And just having, you know, just having people say, shit, yeah, man, I completely understand how having that kind of stuff going on mere steps from your front door is really distressing. Like, you know, we get you. You know, take the day off. Um, you know, just being able to you know, just being able to hear people recognize that he was in distress and not tell him that he was bad for being distressed or wrong for being distressed helped tremendously another story um, is that we recently added a coworker which you know that happens in companies and he hadn't been so much integrated into the team yet he made, he because that takes time, especially if you work remotely. But what he had picked up on is the culture that we created and the, that we are very open about things. So even so, it still surprised me when about four weeks into his job, he called me up and said, listen, I have a depression and I have a depressive episode right now. And here's what's going on with me and here's how it manifests itself. And that is because, A, of, uh, of course, he had somehow learned to talk about depression before that because you just don't, it, it, it wasn't his first time. But I'm not sure how much he talked about this in front of all his coworkers or his boss. And it was, it was a really important thing because that way I could check in on him and help him and we could create uh, ways of working together that would support him in his depression and we fixed some things and we gave him a little support and after a couple of days it got much better um, and while this is n, n equals one still i have the impression that this is because uh, we were able to help him um, that said this is uh, actually a point we wanted to make we're a now com we're a company that's about nine months old, so nothing is like five years proven on anything, and we're still evaluating and uh, and documenting our uh, our examples, and probably going to figure out that certain things are not going to work, and we hope to do um, maybe at uh, at the next uh, Dutch camp uh, do an an, uh, an update on that and uh, and sort of have an ac actually evaluated uh, uh, results from from wh from how we're leading our team. I mean that said, we're also hitting deliverables like the high score in Whack a Mole, so you know I think that kind of speaks for itself. Yeah. Um, another example is uh, that we actually managed to weaponize our co-workers OCD. Um, we know that he's very obsessive convulsive and while we did a company retweet, uh, at a, you know, we rented a big mansion and stayed there for two weeks and uh, worked together and cooked together and uh, hung it out. It got kind of frat housey after a while, like stuff got messy. Exactly. And so we tasked him, and he was gladly to oblige, uh, with cleaning, taking care of the place and cleaning up. Not he basically got to set the standards. Exactly. And it's not the, so much that we abused him as a cleaning person. Um, he set the standards for us and helped us organize in a way that we could uh, take care of, uh, of what we were you know, missing while we were deep down in work. And also take care of his needs, his sensory needs. Um, let's end this part with Miller's Law and then uh, continue to questions. Right. So probably the most important rule that we operate by is that, you know, trying to understand how people mean this, how people mean what they're saying is, you know, is the norm for us. 
you know, Miller's Law uh, is, uh, was, was coined by George Miller, the, the same guy that came up with the magical number seven, plus or minus two. And he said, to understand what another person is saying, you have to assume that it is true and try to imagine what it could be true of. I think this is the single most important lesson for perspective taking, and I hope that you're able to take it with you. So, quickly, some reading recommendations. Um, on autism, um, I'll just go through them quickly. There's a book called Neurotribes by Stephen Silberman, highly recommended. There's um, a really, really great article on Medium called The Boy Whose Brain Could Unlock Autism uh, by uh, Maya Salovitz. Google boy unlock autism for that. Uh, you will find it uh, top, uh, at the top. There's a really fantastic uh, Medium post called You Don't Seem Autistic Unpacking Diagnostic Criteria by Martha Rose Saunders. Uh, I think that's if you search for these kind of terms, it's like number two or number three, but it's also really easy, easily Googleable. And there's, uh, if you want to turn to help, there's the Wrong Planet forum on wrongplanet.net. For ADHD, um, there's the self-help subreddit uh, r slash ADHD, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, there's a magazine called Attitude, which has some great articles. There's also all sorts of other articles. Books, the problem with books is if you have ADHD and you're not going to read them, uh, you're probably going to stop by uh, at the half, uh, halfway through the title. Um, if you want to read a book, I haven't read it myself, but there's apparently a book by Russell Barkley called Taking Charge of Adult ADHD that is written in a way that when you have ADHD, you're still gonna, gonna get through it somehow. Um, and there's lots and lots of good YouTube videos on the subject, so if you go into that uh, sphere, that's probably gonna help you. Um, also, searching for advice, just go to the subreddit, put in something like books, and you will find long threads that, uh, that will give you some more info on that. And by that, we say, say thank you and ask for questions. And Thank you very much, Julian and Meredith. It's been a pleasure. wonderful talk, very interesting, very insightful. If you have any questions, please line up at the microphones. If you're leaving, please be quiet. The, the acoustics in the tents are rather awful. So, we have the first question at the second mic, please. Thank you. Interesting talk. A question is uh, how, you spot, uh, how you spot burnout symptoms. Tempers flaring, for one thing. Um, people being less responsive, um, like, in, in, in a lot of cases, I'm pattern matching off of myself, right? I know that when I'm burning out, like, I stop responding to people as quickly, and so I tend to look for that in other people. You know, we do the check, we, we check in with people like Julian was talking about. Yeah, I didn't fully get the question because I... Uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you spot burnout before it burnout happens? Burnout symptoms, How do you right, spot yeah. it before it happens? Yeah, um, by, uh, for, by creating a work environment that, uh, that takes care of uh, people thinking too much about I work. I mean, make it, make it safe for people to say when they're burning out. And also, you know, this is more important for the Americans than the Europeans, but geez, we've had so many problems with Americans clocking in and being like, yeah, so I'm kind of sick today, but I'm going to try and push it out. And we're just like, no, go to bed. Your job today is to get well. Yeah. Mike at the front. Thank you very much. Uh, please don't take this question as a criticism. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, if you praise in public but criticize in private, yeah. how do you deal with uh, keeping track that the multiple complaints actually add up so that the person who is being criticized because maybe somebody else complained about them uh, is not like, oh, this is the first time we hear about it, and then 10 times, oh, this is the first time we hear about it, and then you don't spot abusive behaviors. Okay. Okay, um, so, I guess, so I guess we're talking about this from a slightly different perspective, um, uh, in, insofar as you're talking about bottom-up and lateral criticism, and we're talking about top-down. That's a very good point. I mean, there's definitely a, a massive... So, like, there's a big culture of openness among management, right? So, like, if somebody comes to me with something, I will talk with Julian about it. I will talk with uh, the CEO about it just so that they're in the loop, right? So, you know, we make sure that, that you know, momentary or ongoing issues are something that, you know, that all of management knows about, you know. 
We've never had the problem where somebody, where somebody, do, where somebody, you know, tries to play mom and dad off each other, basically. But I know that that's a thing that happens. I was a kid. <laughs> and we, we also had situations where, like, casual remarks triggered uh, some sort of OCD. Um, or even uh, just a misunderstanding. Problem, and, and it turned out to be a misunderstanding. But gladly, right now, um, with a team of about 10 people, people still, like, we talk a lot and we listen a lot, and people have, feel free enough to just come up at any point in time to talk about, us about uh, to talk to us about problems they might have with uh, coworkers, and we help resolve them together. Good question. Thanks for asking. Next one in the back, please. Yes, yes yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, about the um, criticizing private thing, um, you have code reviews, probably you have retros about what didn't go well in the project or in yeah. the current sprint. How do you deal with that then? Because if management or a coworker explicitly asks, what did I do wrong? And I mean, I have coworkers that apparently are never upset and I'm never upset if someone says you, your code is wrong. But I know those people exist, and um, I've interacted with them in the distant past. So, how does how do you figure this yes. review of explicitly bad stuff in a group work mm. into don't criticize well, in we, public? We don't do that many group reviews, but yeah, that's the funny thing is like we've kind of modified the way we do retros, and a lot of this is because of the fact that we're such a distributed team. But we tend to do we actually tend to do uh, two on one retros. Like Julian and I will make time with every developer individually, just because we're we're spread out over nine time zones, and it's, uh, and it's actually really hard to get everybody in one place at one time for a long meeting. Either, you know, either it's stupid o'clock in the morning for somebody or it's stupid late at night for somebody. Also, um, being, having been a scrum master, um, you don't, like retros are not the place for criticizing, that, or at least I feel retros are not the place for criticizing people in person, but rather criti criticizing the team as a whole and doing, putting in con constructive criticism. Yeah, re retros, retros, retros I think, are more for we fell down on this, not I fell down on this. Yes, and it's not so much you did this wrong, but how do we get this better? We need to improve on this. And that's also a way of you know, phrasing and, mm -hmm. and, and, and improving things, is it's not about blaming others, it's about trying to get better. So um, that's also a way to do it. But actually, you're, yeah, what, what Meredith said, we're, we, we, we do this a little differently, but there's ways to do this uh, even if, you, if you're all set together in the same office. Yeah, I mean, on the code review side, uh, that also tends to be one-on-one. -on -one. And me personally, I try, to make my, I try to make my criticism constructive, and I try to tie it to the spec. Like, you know, if, if somebody is, uh, you know, well, we're starting to run out of time, yeah, actually, okay. so I'm not going to try to get into the details. Shorter, we need to get through all the yeah. people crossing questions. Ch gentleman in the back, please. But again, constructive criticism. In a, in a job-related environment, for trying to find the right job or the right task for person's specific talents, how do you avoid to pigeonhole people? How do you make sure that they're uh, continuing to evolve, especially when you're talking about conditions that might have a lot of um, prejudice or prejudgments? This has actually happened. So um, one of our developers, we originally hired to do back-end work. Um, but we also have a, sort of a more researchy project going on. Um, and you know, uh, Claudio was asking about burnout earlier. You know, one of the things that Julian and I noticed was that he was, you know, he was seeming you know, kind of less engaged with you know, the back-end work that he'd done. Well, I knew, I, I knew this guy's background, and I was like, hmm, I wonder if he would be happier on the research side. And so we went and talked to him, and you know, now we're transitioning him into a role that he's happier for, uh, that he's going to be happier with, that he thinks he's going to be happier with, crucially. Um, I mean, because everybody's got different ideas about how they want to grow, right? Um, it's, the, also, it's also the question about, like, it's basically about caring about your team, right? It's not always possible to um, immediately accommodate someone who is sort of unhappy with what they're doing right now, because A, the work needs to be done, B, there's not enough resources, there might not be enough money to put them in another project, and because there's you know, three people on that project and that's what it's tough for, and you don't want to pull anybody out because that's unfair to that person. But there's, the important point is listening and taking care of and sort of giving people a, a perspective and understanding where they're at. And that's uh, basically saying, I hear you, 
Um, uh, I will I will try and make this work for you. Let's talk. Uh, le let's keep uh, talking about this and not just shoving them off, but you know, actually listening. Okay. And unfortunately, I have to cut you. I have to cut you off. I will. We'll happily take questions over there, though. Yeah. So uh, please give another round of applause to Meredith and Julian. Can we get one also, slide? Also, thank you very much to my friend Reagan in Seattle. She gave, us, she gave us a huge amount of help getting this together. Reddit, Twitter, Tumblr, we pulled a lot of stuff off of social media. Uh, our team, our, our, uh, the, the beta audience that helped us uh, pra uh, go through this last night. Thank you, everybody. This has been great. Thank you.